first first thing I want to say is um, just explain the differing views on this topic that I'm aware of, because obviously there could be a multitude of views that I'm not aware of. Uh, and to be honest, uh, I only ever thought that there was one view, because I thought the one view was, well, we don't know the age, right? Nobody knows the age of accountability, and, and there's just a, a, a period of time where somebody, a child comes to the understanding. Um, but I learned, I, re I learned recently that there is a different view, and I just wanted to go over that with you and then explain why I don't have that view and why I have the view that I do. So one view is that the age is unknown, the age of the counter. We don't know what the age is, but there comes a point in time where the child has knowledge, and when they have knowledge, now they're held accountable and they need to believe on Jesus Christ, which is my position. Um, the other position is that the age of accountability is 20 years old. Um, the age of accountability is 20 years old. And I just want to show you the verses that are used in order to support this view. Because you might be thinking, 20 years old? How, how can the age of accountability be 20 years old? But when you look at the verses, it is a reasonable position. But I'll explain to you as I go into the sermon why it's not my position. But we, we, looked, we, cut, we went to a couple of these verses last week. But we'll just go there quickly again so you can see them. <laughs> Uh, Deuteronomy 1 verse 34 and the Lord heard your voice and remember this is the them going into the, uh, the promised land and sending in the spies and the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear saying surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers save Caleb the son of Jephunneh he shall see it and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon and to his children because he hath wholly followed the Lord also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. But Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Now this is the key verse. Moreover your little ones, uh, moreover your little ones, which he said should be a prey, and your children. So just note the phrase there, little ones and children. So this is not only referring to babies, this is referring to all young people which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. So, I hope I'm representing the view correctly, but from what I understand is, they'll take this passage and they'll say, look, well, the reason why they were led into the promised land, we learned in Hebrews, they were not led in because of unbelief. And then they say, see, the, the little ones had no knowledge between good and evil, tying in what we learned last week with Romans 7, and saying, that's why they were led in. Right? Because they did not know between good and evil, they were let in. Then we go to Numbers, where we actually see uh, the events unfold, where the spies were sent in, and then they come back, and you have the eight spies saying, you know, giving an evil report. You have two spies, Caleb and Joshua, are giving a good report, and the people decided to believe the eight spies, right? And then they didn't go in, right? They murmured and, and wanted to even to the point of stoning uh, Caleb and Joshua. <clears throat> well, they wanted to. They didn't obviously stone them. And we read here in Numbers 14, 26, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me, saying unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. So this is basically where God says to the people, who didn't want to go into the promised land, he basically says, hey, well, you're going to die in this wilderness. You're not going to go in. And look at this. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole family, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into, that land, into the land, concerning which I swear to, to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones... So again, remember what we read in Deuteronomy 1. But your little ones, which he said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they, thou, they shall fall in this wilderness. And then um, it goes on with the story. So the view goes like this. So, you know, children, we, you know, uh, don't have this uh, knowledge between good and evil. We see that the example in Deuteronomy 1, where they were, were not able to enter in because of unbelief, it mentions that children don't have the knowledge between good and evil. And then Numbers 14, it shows that the children that didn't have the knowledge between good and evil was everyone under 20. So 
That's how they come to that, that, um, that conclusion that, hey, at 20 years old is actually when you um, now, uh, I guess, know the difference between good and evil, you're accountable for your sin, and then um, that's the age of accountability. Now, if you look at it the way, like you're probably thinking, now that sounds reasonable, right? That sounds, you're like thinking, well, that sounds reasonable. So maybe the age of accountability is 20 when it's explained that way. Um, and, and a point I just want to make here is, you know, it does sound reasonable if your basis for this doctrine starts from the Old Testament and, and, and doesn't, I think, take into account what we learn in the New Testament. But another thing I just want to say is, you know, when we disagree on, on doctrine, you know, disagree on the basis of Scripture, you know, because I don't know if you got, for those of you who are on Facebook, you know, obviously we post these things on Facebook and sometimes discussions will ensue, not just with uh, sermons about our church, but also sermons from other churches and things that people post. And, you know, I'm often very disappointed with brothers and sisters in Christ insulting each other, personal attacks against each other, insulting each other's intelligence when they're discussing the Bible. I mean, I think, you know, the, the spiritual thing to, to do as brothers and sisters in Christ is be able to discuss things in love, you know, keep the peace, you know, be able to discuss the Bible without insulting one another's intelligence because we all want to know what the Bible says, you know. So I just think it's funny that often it's the people that think they're the most spiritual, right? They think they're the most spiritually mature and yet when they get zealous about doctrine, they're the ones that so quickly get into the flesh and are throwing personal attack and throwing insults. You would think somebody that is more spiritually mature would have the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no more. So that, that tells me that the Bible is saying, you know, you can never have enough of those things, right? Because there's no law forbidding you from having more fruit of the Spirit. So I think um, your spiritual maturity shows in you know, how much fruit of the Spirit you have not necessarily how much doctrine you know. And I'm not saying that doesn't mean knowing doctrine is not important. It is very important, right? But we just have to remember, I think personally, you know, your character, the fruit of the Spirit is more important than doctrine. Ideally, we want both, right? But I think a lot, a lot of the time, Christians in our circle, we get so focused on the doctrine and get so zealous about the doctrine, which is good, but don't throw out the fruit of the Spirit in the, um, in, at the same time. So, you know, this is, you know, this is a reasonable view if you look at it this way. So it's not that people who believe this are stupid or are not intelligent. You know, they, they have a basis and it's a biblical basis for why they believe the things that they do. So if we want to, you know, go against and say, hey, why don't I accept this view? Well, then you have to offer an, a viable alternate explanation, right? You can't just say, ah, oh, well, that doesn't make sense. I don't like it. and just offer your opinion. You have, to, you have to say, okay, that's what the Bible says, but is there another explanation for what this, these verses mean that give a different opinion, and is that more reasonable? Um, that's how we have to come at it. So there are two views that I know of. So there's the 20-year-old view. There's the unknown age view, which is my position. But you know, if, if, I was, if I was pushed for an age, and I don't, I don't believe this, but I just wanted to show you this verse, these verses, because they were a bit interesting. Talking about splitting up ages. Because if somebody really pushed me for, for an age, and I said, well, what's my best guess at what age of the age of accountability is? I might say five years old, you know? But, I, 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 but my, that doesn't mean my position is five years old. I'm just saying that would be my best guess, and I'm not gonna be dogmatic about that, because you know, I, I don't think that's the right application of these verses. If I look here in Leviticus 27, it says here, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When a man shall make a singular vow, the persons shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. So it talks about how the monetary value of different ages of people. And I just want to show you here the breakdown. It says, And thy estimation shall be of the male from twenty years, even unto sixty years old, even thy estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. And if it be a female, then thy estimation shall be 30 shekels. And if it be from 5 years old, even unto 20 years old, um, then thy estimation shall be of the male 20 shekels, and for the female 10 shekels. And if it be from a month old, even unto 5 years old, then thy estimation shall be of the male 5 shekels of silver, and for the female thy estimation shall be 3 shekels of silver. And if it be from 60 years old and above, if it be a male, then thy estimation shall be 15 shekels, and for the female, 10 shekels. 
Um, and then it goes on to say if you can't afford the estimation of different things you should do. <coughs> so I just wanted to show you the breakdown there. So you see the breakdown is one month, zero to one month, and then one month to five years, and then five years to 20 years, and then 20 years to 60 years, and then 60 years and above. So do we get a glimpse into the different age breakdown? You know, I don't think that's we can dogmatically apply those verses those way because this is about monetary value with a Levitical ordinance. So we can't just run with this and build a doctrine on it. But if somebody was to push me for an age breakdown, I, I mean, this, this is interesting that God gives the breakdown this way. You know, from one month to five years to 20 years to 60 years and 60 years and above. You say, the, um, why is the estimation of somebody that was from 20 to 60, 50 shekels of silver, but Jesus was sold for 30 shekels of silver? I believe it's because um, if you are classified as a servant, I think if you lose, if a master loses a servant, he's reimbursed 30 shekels of silver. So I don't know if that has something to do with Jesus being priced at 30 shekels of silver. When Joseph, Joseph was sold into slavery, he was sold for 20 shekels of silver because he was between 5 and 20 because he was a young man. So, you know, and, but, you know, you might ask, well, what, what do the ages represent? You know what, I don't really know. But, you know, I could speculate that maybe at a month old, from my own experience, is that when a child becomes, like, sort of self-aware? Because, you know, when a baby is newborn, they don't really know what's going on. They don't know that, you know, it's just all instinct. But it seems that about one month old, they start to be more aware of things. Like, Abel now, he's starting to take notice of things. You know, he's noticed that we're there. Is, there, is it the age of, like, self-awareness, where they just know what's happening around them? Who knows? And then your five years, is that the age of accountability? You know, where they start to acknowledge that, or they start to understand the law and they're accountable for their sin? Maybe, maybe not. I do think 20 years old is when a man becomes an adult, you know, and they are um, now a man not under the authority of their parents. And then 20 to 60, and then 60 is um, probably when you're you know, a senior citizen. Maybe that's the retirement age. 60 years old, who knows? So, so just a thought there, but you know, I would not apply necessarily this verse. It's just if somebody pushed me for an age, maybe I'd say, hey, you know, this, this is a reasonable explanation for why we would break down the ages we do. Um, God seems to classify those ages differently. But like I said, I would not be dogmatic about that just because this verse doesn't have anything to do with spiritual accountability. It's about monetary value of different ages of um, men and women. <laughs>